might have noticed that ever since I began, I'm always the only female in the room. And, uh, and some ways that's great because people come over to me and they're like, oh, you're the only female, I want to chat to you, which actually happens quite a lot, which is really nice. Um, but at the same time then, that always leads on to why are there other women involved? And how do we get more women into the sport? Um, and so obviously this is something I was like, well, maybe I can have a look into this. So diversity, equity and inclusion is quite a big, broad topic. Some of you might have heard about it in the work setting. It's normally done terribly, really, really badly, um, and is mostly a failure. But hopefully what I can do with this is I'm going to go through each of those three, go through a little bit of like theory behind DEI and hopefully explain to you why we might have a, a, an issue. Sorry to interrupt, but I have an apology to make. Okay. Um, I copied this subject material onto the website and I thought, oh, they've misspelled equality. So I changed it to equality, which I know is a leading line for you. Because you're going to explain to us the difference. Thank you very much for that. I will explain the difference to you. There is a difference between equity and equality, so I will recover that for you today. <laughs> so thanks for the lead in. Any time. Thank you later. So obviously, what do we mean by diversity? So I guess within sort of the general paragliding community, we're generally talking about gender and ethnicity. Why aren't there more women? And not my words, pale male scale. So. You know, we're kind of saying, why have we not got a range that is... <laughs> not my words. <laughs> but actually, there's a lot more to diversity. So it's really, now oh, that's really badly positioned there. So we've got um, all the, essentially all these different ways that people can identify themselves both due to their culture, their sexual orientation, neurodivergence, social class, disability, your age, your religion, your sort of political opinions, like literally anything that you kind of identify as is what we can kind of consider as diversity. What's new, new, what did you say, neurodivergence? Neurodivergence. Oh, I'd like to explain that, sorry. So essentially it's people who might have autism, who might have, you know, on, on spectrums, it's different ways in which people um, sort of neurologically kind of connect with the world. Okay. Um, so, for example, when we have a whole bunch of text to learn for the pilot exam uh, and your difficulty with reading text is, is pretty apparent. What's, uh, what's the phrase? Uh, dyslexia. Dyslexic. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, okay. dyslexia is... So, that, uh, you know, that's something that's been kind of encompassed by things like driving exams where you can, you can learn visually or you can learn audio by audio, not by a, a whole bunch of text. Thanks, Matthew. My daughter in law says I'm on the spectrum. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I really shouldn't be used as a term of abuse. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Isn't it partly a prerequisite for being a paradigm pilot? Yeah, yeah. Slightly on the spectrum. <laughs> Moving on. Um, <laughs> not my opinion. Um, <coughs> what I will say with this is each of those obviously has their own unique challenges that come with them, and I cannot and will not represent all of those. Obviously, I cannot represent people of different ethnicities. I cannot um, for LGBTQ communities. But what I'm hoping to do is obviously try and lay down the foundations to having those discussions so that we can sort of talk about. How do we approach these things and how can we maybe sort of lay a foundation for kind of engaging with these different areas? So we kind of already know paragliding community isn't very diverse. So thanks Martin, you've uh, provided some really useful statistics. So um, the first ones, these the majority of them have come from 2022. Um, but Martin very kindly has actually updated the female pilot, which we have to say has gone up. So this used to be 6% females. Oh, wow. in 2022 and it's now up to 7.5 which is okay. great cool. but equally 7.5 percent isn't representative of society <laughs> uh, and obviously this isn't just unique to the uk this is across a lot of european countries so the ones we've got for example here spain is quite similar to the uk um, all the way down to probably france being the best but still only having 17 percent participation of female pilots is still not great 
Um, we don't have any statistics for things like ethnicity or any other sort of protected characteristics. Um, but, as I say, this is just maybe a little bit of reflection of how maybe the, the, the sort of general paradigm community is. So, obviously then, why is this the case? Can just go back a slide. I just want to make one point. Yeah. The thing I found really interesting about that is there's a correlation between the average age and the number of female pilots. So the younger the average age, the more female pilots there are. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you'll find that more or less fits Generally, yeah, uh, fits, yeah. Generally, yeah. Generally, yeah. Related to the detail of Don't know, and draw your own conclusions why it is. I'm not going to jump to any conclusions, just set the facts. <laughs> Could we say 20 years ago? I, I seem to remember more female pilots back in my cohort as I learned. That was uh, turn of the century. Was the BHPA's average age younger back then? Do we know? I don't know. I'm guessing it was. Okay. I actually remember early days of Panama, I don't know if you remember And there were quite a few female pilots in those days. The problem is, they have babies and families to bring up, you know. Not that's normal in life, mm -hmm. and this is one of the main reasons why they drop out of home. Yeah, it'd be interesting to survey people who leave and find out, you mm -hmm. know, what their actual reasons are. To be honest, um, but yeah, back in 1980, <laughs> were there 80 year old members in the club? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. So the, the the average age has gone up massively. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Because we're all still here. <laughs> do the, um, does the BHPA do like exit polls or anything? You know, if someone says they're not renewing the membership, do they actually ask why? No, they don't. Mm, they've, they've, not generally, but a couple of times they've run around and said, you know, do you know, have you changed your email address? You know, try, just try to touch base with people. Uh, I don't think there was any sort of general statistic as to why people are leaving. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the mixture of mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be interesting to find out at some point if possible, but difficult to do, obviously. Um, so, yes, to address this question then, really, on why, why do we not have representation? I think one thing we really need to come to understand is this term intersectionality. So intersectionality examines how a person's identity, so that's all the things we've just discussed, so things about your gender, your ethnicity, your sexuality, um, cultural kind of things, how do they affect your access to opportunities and privileges? And that will vary for different people and they will all have their different challenges. And I'm sure many of you as well will also have had challenges if you're carers, for example, if you work full time, you know, we all have our various different reasons as to why we can engage with the activities we want to do more or less than others, for example. So, one of the things, obviously, was about why there are not so many women in this sport. So, I'm going to start and focus a little bit on that. Partly, obviously, because it's a good question. Um, partly because, as female, I feel like I can actually engage with that. And there's also a lot of uh, actual research into this, so it's a really interesting topic. And so, I can dive a little bit into this. So I'm going to start with this, uh, this video and I'm thinking or I'm hoping probably most, well I hope most of you haven't, but I'm sure many of you will have heard this expression at some point. So hopefully this will ring uh, a note to you all.
example really of demonstrating that really society has taught women that sport and being good isn't for them and it's so ingrained into our beliefs in society that actually women sort of struggle to identify in themselves and this is actually something that's kind of quite well documented in quite a wide range of different sort of scenarios and this is a really fantastic book I could go into a whole talk on this topic um, but this book really goes into really how sports is completely set up. Society doesn't include women in sport. Um, right through from women's health, women's sports science, through to how the media portray athletes and female coaches, um, our derogatory and sort of degrading and the terminology used around female athletes in comparison to male athletes really sets into our society that sport is not for women. And actually this does have a huge impact, and this isn't just words. So quite a lot of research has been done into this. So women in sports and organisations do a lot of research, and they found a report that only 30% of parents believe that playing sport is important for their daughters, in comparison to 41% of parents thinking the same for their sons. And 87% of girls want to participate and enjoy being outdoors, but only 40, but 49% don't actually feel safe exercising in their local park. I'm sure hopefully many of you have also heard of This Girl Can. They've done a lot of campaigns on TV uh, and nationwide, and they've done a really interesting report that said 1.75 million fewer women are regularly exercising in comparison to men. And there's a really wide range of reasons for this. Some of them obviously about uh, body image, people, um, women don't like wearing tight clothing, showing their bodies, getting changed in front of other people, through to um, this kind of idea that they're not good enough, so um, also holding back the group. Kind of really interesting as well that being too good was also cited as a reason for women not wanting to be involved in sport. And then obviously there was a whole reference as well about priorities. So women are being told, you know, you should prioritise family, raising children, you mentioned that, for example, um, and sport isn't for them. And this is actually worse if we look for women in colour as well. So the Muslim Sports Association recently did a, a survey of British Muslim women, and actually 97% said that they would like to improve their participation in sport. And when I did launch my project last year, which I'll go into a little bit more, it was really interesting that it was exclusively Muslim community groups that were really interested in engaging in paragliding um, and were really keen to be involved in this sport. But they were also showed, for example, that 43% of current sport facilities aren't appropriate for them, and 33% of had a third of people are having negative impacts on their actual engagement in that. And one of the big challenges is having women's only spaces and facilities that are kind of accommodating for their needs. Yes, sir. What was wrong with the sports facilities? Why it it, about having sort of like uh, women's only spaces, facilities, that kind of thing. So when I was chatting to some of the leaders of these sort of uh, Muslim community groups that were like, we're really keen, we really want to get involved. And they were like, okay, but how many female instructors do you have? You know, doing tandems would be great, but how many female tandem pilots are there? 
And I said, to be honest, for some people that would be a complete um, real barrier for engagement. Is that so? If someone's got a, a female changing facility, like in a sports centre, that's mm. okay, or is there a problem with that? I mean, as I said, I can't represent <laughs> directly all of their, their personal needs because I'm not um, I'm not Islamic, you know, faith myself. So I wouldn't want to say exactly what their, their requirements are. Um, but obviously, and it, and it will vary as well between individuals. So some people would be fine, some are definitely not, and yeah, would need strict kind of like um, women's only sessions as well, for example. They would just literally want to be able to go and fly with women, be with women, um, and that's kind of just also what's culturally acceptable for them. So, um, you know, we need to be considering these things if this is something that we would want to bring them into this sport, for example. When you said they don't need um, to fly tandem before you start flying, how many people here actually had a tandem flight before they took up learning the sport? I think this is something I'm going to come to though. I will kind of touch on this as well about some of the challenges for getting into paragliding. So I'll come back to this as well. But uh, it's a good point that, you know, maybe the majority of us, you know, we haven't necessarily, but for people who this is a real big step for them, I mean, it's not, you know, a, a tame sport, you know, it's a real big challenge for people to potentially get into this sport. That this is uh, having a tandem flight would be a, a, a suitable potential step for them. Um, but we, yeah, I'll touch on that a little bit coming up. Um, but obviously, that's just about women. I'm going to touch a little bit more about their extra challenges on. on uh, accessing the outdoors because we're also an outdoor sport as well so um, and this is a video from the British Mountaineering Council which kind of touches on a little bit of sort of range of different uh, challenges of, of getting outdoors as well. Lots of people consider the outdoors as a free space that's open to everyone but for a lot of people it really does not feel that way.
we've all got the same hill to climb, but we don't all have the same start line. I'm very conscious, and particularly in a way that I wasn't years ago, that I have been very fortunate. There was quite a gap then. Um, that's why I realised when I was there, and that gap could be due to not having a good relationship with um, parents and whatnot. They're usually the ones to incentivise their children to take part in stuff like this, and not having them around can impact multiple areas. I want to give myself a big pat on the back for the resilience that I sort of like displayed in my life, which I do make the effort to be in green spaces, despite whatever. You know, despite like the challenges I have to kind of make that happen, I make it happen. But I'm proud of the fact that you know my daughter was a couple of steps ahead of me today. I think I feel I genuinely feel bad. Um, I think we we're, we're all happy to kind of operate in our own little world, aren't we? You just kind of I'm going to go out for a walk, and you don't really take time to think about the fact that actually there are others that would possibly like to do this, and they just can't. Yeah, absolutely, access is not available for everybody, not in the way it should be. There are a multitude of invisible barriers to the outdoors for many people, which disproportionately affects marginalised communities in society. An estimated 2.1 billion in health costs could be saved if everyone had good access to green space. The pleasure and the life fulfilling experiences one could have. I'm just so sorry that it's not so easy for others to experience the things that I have, and it'd be great if more people had those opportunities. Please share this video to show your support and help us push for an outdoors that is truly accessible to all. that's kind of demonstrated kind of a range of different kind of challenges and this is just getting into the outdoors which is not even before we've started flying kind of thing you know and how we're disproportionately affecting marginalized communities and differences in terms of you know people's access to you know parents and influence from the people around them and how normalized you know being in the countryside is for various different people um, so Again, we've got another layer of additional challenge happening here. And then this is obviously before we get to paragliding. So obviously everyone will say, well, it's really expensive to get into. You know, you just need a bit of money, right? Um, which is true. Um, the weather is also a problem, particularly in the UK. But I also did a survey for communities that already engage with the outdoors and said, what are your perceptions? What are your challenges for getting into the sport? And every single response came back with, is it safe? And I think this is a real thing that, if you don't know much about paragliding, that might be absolutely terrifying, and you'd go, what the hell, and run for the hills, kind of thing, never come back and ever consider it. Um, but if you have a bit of basic knowledge, you know, if people begin on aid gliders, how relatively safe they are, you know, the kind of conditions you start with, a little bit of basic knowledge and understanding about the sport could go quite a long way to helping to overcome this question of is it safe? So coming now to your question Martin, what's the difference between equity and equality? So obviously I've kind of just shown that we've got quite a lot of variety of people's opportunities and ability to access our sports and this is where we need to kind of understand equity. So equality is actually about saying that we're going to give everyone the same resource, we're going to help everyone we're going to give them all a box. But what it means is that even though there are three people there, still not all three of them can look over the fence to see the game that's happening behind them. Um, equity, on the other hand, recognises that three different people will have different situations and different starting points. And actually that what means that we need to provide some more support to certain people over other people. So somebody like them on the left, doesn't need any support to be able to look over the fence and see the game and equally some people need to see more so it's about redistributing our resources and support to people to allow everyone to look over that fence and to see the game that's happening behind it so this is why when people say oh you'd object if there was a men's only group well it's because we need to provide the support to those that are more marginalized 
in order to have the same opportunities, the same benefits, the same feelings of inclusion and accessibility as everyone else. So that's why. Can I just point out on that one? See, the little, the guy on the left, the old guy, mm -hmm. he's grown up so he can see over the fence, yeah? So the guy in the middle, he can see over it as well, and he's half grown up. And the little guy hasn't grown up yet, so he can't see over the fence. But he will be able to when he's older. I think what this is demonstrating isn't necessarily age, but it's also no, about... Well, it's bigger, it'll be able to see over the fence, so that's not really a good uh, example, is it? Why have short legs? You may also just be general size. The idea is also to think about, you know, when we saw the, the British Mountaineering Council's one and just how different people have different starting points. It's just an illustration so of how different people will have the different starting points in order to get to the same point, a same end goal, really. I would say on that video, I see the point we're trying to make, but the size 22 African mask, she was third. She was right at the front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it just is again it's demonstrating that different people will have different challenges. So there are some people who it's not necessarily, you know, purely because of ethnicity, it's not purely because of um, class, social class, it might not be purely because you're female and things, but it's the combination of people's identities that also then create the different variations of people's level of accessibility. So the fact that she is black African, she also said people are surprised she doesn't see people like her in the countryside. That also is a huge challenge to overcome, to have that sense of belonging, that you belong in that environment if you don't see people like you. And so that might disproportionately affect uh, individuals based on their own personalities and their characteristics. But it is a challenge for you know, uh, people of, of colour to be in the outdoors, for example. So, it, you know, all these things, it's Sorry, just demonstrating it's an, it's an interesting, why is it a challenge for people of colour to be in the outdoors? Probably, and this would be my perception, is where do these communities live? What is their access to the outdoors? Everybody faces limitations mm -hmm. to everything, to school, to sport, to musical instruments, to the outdoors. Mm -hmm. If you live in inner city Birmingham, you come from an Afro-Caribbean community, then if you want to go out to the outdoors, you, you, you can, but you've got to travel, and that's a limitation of, of where you live. It's a limitation of the community you've grown up in. It's a limitation of your socio-economic community. Now, what this doesn't address here, and sorry, this is it's a really challenging topic, why working class male from Stoke-on-Trent. I wouldn't get in the Air Force now if I applied, because I went to a comprehensive, I was white working class from a working class background. I'm male, stable and pale, I'm not what the Air Force wants. But in the height of grasshopper, I had a picture of Douglas Barber in my garage, and the, that inspired me, and I was supported by my parents. There's nothing to stop any of those people supported by the right family network to do what they want to be told they can do what they want. So a lot of these a lot of these problems we're talking about are actually within the family unit, within the community they grow up in. And it, it's incredibly difficult. If you look at the equity versus the equality equation there, how much resource is required to achieve equity? And is that are we targeting the right people here or should we be targeting the communities in the schools? So the only people that are stopping you doing this are yourselves and your parents. Because they're the ones that are limiting your aspirations. There is a, a point in this in that it's also what is culturally a norm. So it is not culturally uh, a norm for people of uh, African or uh, ethnic minorities necessarily to engage with the outdoors. Um, and that's due to a number of reasons of which will all be quite specific to them. So there is that, and this is why we can't just, this is coming to a point of, we can't just sit back and expect diversity to happen. But we'll come to this, we'll come to this point of like, yes, you're right, so that you need to go to the sources, right? Um, and I think it's not because of necessarily a lack of willing, because when you provide people with these opportunities, you reach out to them, as I've kind of been doing, you find people are interested, but this is why people don't, they can't get to it without that support. Interesting on their terms. Yeah. Which, which, which again, is, a, is, a, is a, an interesting challenge in itself, isn't it? Yes, we'll engage, but only on our terms. 
Yeah, well, so it, you know, it's, um, about, it's about, you know, if you want to go and partake in the great British society, we're all open. Anyway, I'll let you know. I'll, uh, I'll, we'll, come to, we'll come to this, I think, a little bit more later on. Um, so now I want to do a little bit of an interactive poll. So I hope this is going to work. I hope people have got the phones. I hope people have got signal. So if you can, either for this technology. scan the QR code or go to menti.com. And if that doesn't work, you can go to the website and you can put in a code and hopefully... Can I borrow a glasses, Trev? Yeah, um, <laughs> <cool. laughs> Has everyone managed? You've got the sorry. I've got the excuse, yeah. Right, here we go. Do you want to use my phone? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. she hasn't changed slides yet. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I'm just letting people. Sorry, you're going to have loads of in, um, things now. What, find out loads of. You find out loads of things. As interesting game. Come on, Okay, is everyone in? We do a lesson on how to switch your mobile phone. <laughs> is everyone in? Yeah. Okay. So we've obviously had a bit of a break. How how well do we know people in this room? Do you want right? to submit answers? Well, why well, does that work? That's done this right. Can I do it? That's where it works. Okay. So it's live. It's also not us, so don't worry. Yeah, it's very close. So that's yeah. room divided, everybody over 50 and everybody under 50. <laughs> so, I mean, we've got quite a nice distribution there, but also we've got a few people who don't know anyone. So, maybe uh, right. we need to have a little think about <laughs> how we're engaging people, potentially. Okay, next question. Have you ever heard or seen not directed at you any discriminatory, inappropriate, or abusive language or behaviour in a paradigm setting. We're not necessarily talking about in the Dales Club, we're talking about anywhere. Okay. So good. Um, <laughs> is it all right to change your mind? Come on, you got to try. Do you know anybody who's indecisive? That's the next question. I'm thinking about it. So, quite overwhelmingly, there, an answer is yes. Have you ever had discriminatory, inappropriate, or abusive language or behaviour directed at you? In a paragliding setting. In a paragliding setting. Oh, in a paragliding setting. Oh, oh, right. 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 Well, I'm totally discriminating. Sw yeah. Swipe left, right. Kevin, right. go back. Yes, <laughs> bloody hang on. Can I retract my answer? Yes, I'm okay. So, every one of these is in the so paragliding right. setting. Correct? In some kind of, yeah, either in a club night yeah. on the hill, you know, we're talking about the, as, as a community, right? Yeah, all my life. What does that mean? Is that Some kind of assumptions going on about our abilities. 
if we're getting that level of uh, advice, unwanted advice from people. Yeah, but unsolicited yeah. advice isn't necessarily no, that good. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes we need unsolicited <laughs> advice, especially yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no. That's up to you. But um, it's it's kind of a unwanted. Do we do we need it? Unwanted. Unwanted is kind of yeah. 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 But, yeah. 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 but yeah. 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 it's a bit like using language, isn't it? Have you ever felt unwelcome or not included? Are we talking flying here? <laughs> I'm in the paraphernalia community. You know, I've been sat here in the room talking to me because I've been talking to some of them. We're not talking to some of them. Oh, I can do it. Oh, I can do it. Okay, so about half of us then at some point haven't felt necessarily included in, within our own sport. Okay. Only because the Northern Club's come down on our little bit. Do you feel like you have similar peers to you in the club? And that could be related to age, gender, sexuality, <coughs> ethnicity, anything that you identify with. So overwhelmingly, yes, there's a couple of people who don't. Sorry. Who's reading it? Okay, is everyone ready now? Yeah, okay. So great, obviously most of us feel like we have some kind of inclusion, you know, we have people that we relate to. Again, when we were talking to that, we were looking at the British Mountaineering Council and we've had two African ladies, both of them saying they don't see people like them and that's really important for that sense of belonging. So but the majority do, there's still a couple that don't. It's kind yeah. of a little bit like, do we feel like we belong? It's really a question. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. I don't want to, uh, but that's actually we don't, we're not supposed to work with two people who own that. That's a crying shame. And I mean that for them. I don't want to come across patronising at all. But that for me is um, a shame. And that's the best way I can put it. And um, yeah. Yeah, it really is because I think. Because, you're, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it's my background because I, you know, we all have different backgrounds with children and things like that. Mm -hmm. But one of my values is um, because being on both ends of that extreme mm -hmm. is that's not that. Yeah. Completely. And if you have ever been in a position of minority, in whatever way, you suddenly become extremely conscious of that fact. Like, yeah, obviously, to varying degrees of things, but you are always conscious of that, you know. Obviously, most of the time, I'm also the only female. It didn't necessarily bother me, but you're very conscious of it. Yeah. Um, it makes a difference, really, to how you feel in that, in that environment, doesn't it? So, but yeah, thanks. It's surely... We are all peers here, we are all so good. we all have paragliding in common, so consequently, even if we walk on a hill, even if we're sitting in the room, we have some similar peers right now. Mm. I so think I don't see how that question lies. Well, it was because you have talked about how, how the individual I've got peers, I've got paragliding peers. Yeah, mm. group, that's fantastic for you. you know, the, 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 the town person themselves perceived it. It's, it's the whole point. It's, it's, how, to each how, how, it's how you perceive your own situation with regards to how you perceive um, your own environment, because that's what matters to that individual. Mm -hmm. So you can't just take a picture of how one person may feel comfortable in one situation, yeah. the same person on the outside yeah, look, look, look yeah. or sound exactly the same, but have a different mental experience. Well, it could be right. But, but a, a, a trainee's not necessarily going to feel that because they're not in the in group. That's so that, anyway, yeah. But none of us answered this question. Absolutely, yeah. That's not how I'm going to go at Yeah. You've got a new screen, it's not coming through. I think fire fighting is basically on your own perceptions, really, on how you feel in an environment. Um, and that will vary from the problem. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the point of trying to make, really. I'm not in PC. Sorry, I've got to explain this to you. Trevor's still struggling with his UR. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Sorry, <laughs> sorry. That's um, my fault for not just I'm putting I'm Trevor. I'm just scamming. <laughs> so, uh, just go to the menti.com domain name and then you type in that number. Yes, yeah, so if you go to the website. We haven't been very inclusive on Trevor. No, you'll download some more information. That's my fault. I'm not practicing inclusive. Okay. 
Okay, so while you're sorting yourself out, Trevor, hopefully Joe's helping you there. Um, <laughs> if everyone wants to go and say, how big of a problem do you think within the kind of paragliding community is discrimination, inappropriate, or abusive language and behaviour? Brought from not at all, there's no problem, to a little bit, something that might occasionally happen, but it's not a big problem, to there's a fairly substantial problem that happens quite frequently through to the other extreme of there's a systemic cultural norm of, of abusive and inappropriate behaviour. What's the number of 1825? 1825-3692. Do we need to answer this one from our own perception? Yeah. Is it PFD? Yeah. Or from yeah. what we know? This is from your own perception. This is all your own perception of how you how you perceive the community. How strong is this? Because the, the sort of strong. Yorkshire humour and the, the, sort of the adult male to male group on it is often derogatory, undermining. Um, and banter is the word you use. Well, yeah. Well, a lot of the time, it can be it can be hard, it can be harmful or hurtful to be. But, we, they, they, but they just don't show it at the time. And we go away and think about it, and then think, actually, I'm not going to do that, I'm not doing it again. I think the point is you already recognise that that is hurtful language, so therefore it's inappropriate to say it in the first place. Yeah, it just comes out sometimes. <laughs> I think you made my point there. I don't think yeah, you need to say it. Don't think you made my point Okay, so to be honest, like, again, overwhelmingly we're recognising that there is a bit of a problem, right? Yeah. We need to do something because there is, this is a thing that's present in our community, right? Okay. One of the things I learnt when I, I shouldn't be really saying this, when I did an Equal Opportunities course, which was a long time ago, because you can tell me because I called it Equal Opportunities, <laughs> it's they, one of the things they taught us, it's not how the banter is intended, it's how it's received. Well, that's really difficult to predict how somebody's going to receive something. Yeah. But that's, that's one of the principles. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. It's a very valid point. Um, final question then. Have you ever thought about quitting paragliding because of a feeling of lack of inclusion or abuse? So, overwhelmingly, no. Which is fantastic, great. We don't really want people to quit. So, except one person. I quit paragliding because I think I <laughs> well, that's, that's a positive choice. I'm really pleased that you made that real positive step towards what you wanted to do. So, yeah. um, you're abusing yourself when you're going handling. I'm feeling very sorry for the I, people I think it's because yes. Trevor was blessed with an Apco changed. Sierra, which was a very special wing. But also to note that there are two people who have responded yes to this. Which is worrying. Which is extremely worrying. So. Unless it was in. Twice. twice. <laughs> I got really loud. Yeah. I threw it away. Yeah, but how many but people have lost it. already that aren't here tonight? Exactly. You know. I'm still unfurling. So it's something that, you know, we say that, oh, it's just banter, but actually these kind of things do actually have an impact on people. It's something that, you know, we really need to think about if we really want to actually be truly, actually welcoming people. Because I've heard to extremes, you know, I hear people say, Death Club is so welcoming, and in some ways it is, you know, and it's fantastic. And I've never come to a new club and ever felt as welcome as so many people come and approach me and talk to me and chat to me. And equally, I've also heard the other side where actually it can be really challenging and it is difficult to get in when you're a new person into this into this sport. Can I give an anecdote? Yeah. So I learned to fly about ten years ago. Um, it was when I did my AP, and I then went abroad. Um, I'm not saying where I went or who I went with, but it was one of these clubs abroad that you can go to to get some post CP training. And I spent a week listening to quite horrendous banter, if we use that word. Mm -hmm. Horrific stuff about women that I would have been appalled if someone was talking about my mum, my sister. And it was a group of men you know, the white, pale, stale ones. And they looked at me and I think they thought, oh, he's also a white, pale, stale one. Mm. And I was listening to this 
and I felt so uncomfortable the whole week. It, I, I can't repeat what I heard because it's disgusting. But it was done with a bit of ribbing and a bit of laughing and it was banter. And I felt so uncomfortable that whole week. I thought, God, if this is what... And this was my first experience of post-CP. I thought, is this this sport then? Is this what this sport is like? And this was in 2014. And it really put me off. And I thought, I, I love this feeling of flying. Something I've always wanted to do. But I don't know if I can be part of this sport for this reason. And then I thought, they also have made a big assumption. They've assumed I'm one of the lads and I enjoy this banter. And I actually thought to myself, I had a knot in my stomach, I thought, I wonder what they would be like towards me if they knew I was gay. And I kept quiet that whole week. And I came back and then I got a new job that took me out of Yorkshire. And everyone says life gets in the way of this sport a lot with work, and certainly it did. And my work took me away from the sport. But I wonder if maybe I use work as a bit of an excuse for me to move myself out of that sport because of that experience I had. Now, work brought me back to Yorkshire two years ago. And I made the conscious effort, and I said to my partner, I'm going to give it another go. I'm going to join that Dale's Club and I'm going to put myself forward to do something in the club. And that's what I did. And I can say, since I've been here, I've not felt like that. Okay. But I think just listening to some of those comments, I think there are people who do hear that banter and it has made people leave. I just wanted to raise Thanks for sharing. Cheers. Cheers. Fly Spain. What support did you get from the parents? Sorry? What support did you get from the parents? My, my mother thinks I'm crazy for doing this. And my father say, is scared of heights, so he will not come and watch me. No, I didn't mean that. I meant on the fact that you were gay. You know, do they not advise you to say, just tell them to get a bloody ass in you? Know? Well, I was, a lot, I was a bit younger back then, but yeah. I, I, I just, I thought, from the banter I was listening to all week, I made my assumptions about how these people would be towards having a gay guy within the group. Yeah. So, Literally. in 2024, do you yeah. think, with social media and all that rubbish, you know, that the world is a different place now, that people are taking a different attitude? I think the world is better than it was. You know, when I was a teenager in the 90s, if I would said this in front of a room of people like this, look, it help. Can you imagine the reaction? My teachers weren't even allowed to speak about it, otherwise they would have lost their jobs. Okay. You know, and then when people go abroad, flying, one of the things I have to check is, uh, could I be put in prison for being who I am? If I miss that. You know, this is a serious thing, you know, so it's... Uh, Especially in Iran, probably. <laughs> so, you know, there's certain countries I think, yeah, I'll go flying there. But there's other countries where people said, do you fancy this flying trip? And I'm like, Probably not, actually, just to be on the safe side. Because yeah. I could literally be killed. Mm. I could be executed or, or thrown off a building or put in jail. Mm. And thankfully in this country, it's very different now. And it's getting much, much better. And I'm a teacher and I can see that as well in schools. Yeah. It's getting much, much better. Mm. Um, but um, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think this country as a whole is moving forward, absolutely, for the, ben for, for the better. But it's not the same in every country. And, and also, you know, as I said, I've got experience in this club. I can't speak for other clubs. No. But I've had good experience. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's good to hear your views. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And but, presumably but, on this fly spin, probably. Okay. I'm not going to say. <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm not going to say <laughs> where I'm <laughs> Anyway, okay, on this yeah. anonymous trip, I assume that there were no women in the group. No. And if there were, they probably would have left. No, I think it was or, or, or the gentlemen that were using the appropriate language may have moderated their language and their approach. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a difficult one. Yeah, I've, I've got some really good friends that I've known all my adult life that we, I would never talk like that about a woman. But we would rip the 
piss out of each other, and people go, well, these friends. And other people might be uncomfortable. But that's with permission. It, it is. Yes. And now it's the permission to do uh, no, that. Well, it's tacit permission. Yes. The, interesting thing, the interesting thing there is it was a group of peers yeah. that were from the same club or the same environment that were there. Yeah. They go, it's inappropriate. But again, we're in a position where you can, you can highlight. If I, I mean, we'll come on to that now because that actually leads I think, nicely on. Just one thing, if, I, if I'd walked into this club 18 months ago and heard the same stuff I'd heard on that trip, I would have stopped bothering I would have just given up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I watched. And so I, I think the thing is you don't ever make assumptions about anyone. You know, it's, um, it's very easy to make assumptions about me yeah. because I, I, I don't walk around with a rainbow t-shirt on. You know, it's, uh, I shouldn't have to. So the Mike's illustration is not about being gay, which thankfully is, is in a much better position now. It's about what it's like to be in a minority group. Mm -hmm. And it could be yeah. any of those illustrations yeah. that Rio's <laughs> given us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that. That's really funny. Um, I'm conscious of drinks and time. We've chatted a bit more than I was expecting. So I'll go through this quickly because I asked the women's group exactly the same questions as what I asked you. And uh, then I'll let you have a break before I go in. Was women's parrot of box says it up there, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. So we have a women's <laughs> telegram group, which was originally the South East Wales group and has expanded and grown and is now kind of encapsulating women across the UK um, in paragliding and hang gliding. So there's a couple of hang gliders as well there. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to compare results to what you have said. So actually kind of similar, about half of women have also heard discrimination <coughs> against not necessarily directed at them, but they've heard it. About a third of those have also had abusive language, uh, discriminatory uh, or inappropriate comments made directly to them. About two thirds of them have received this unsolicited advice, um, and I'll go into a little bit more about that as well in a bit. About a third of women have reported not feeling welcome or included in their clubs. About one fifth, about 20%, feel like they haven't got someone who they can relate to, which, as I kind of mentioned a bit earlier, that's really important for that sense of belonging and you know, feeling like paragliding is for them. 75% or 738 I'm sure read it. So about three quarters of women, sort of similar to you actually, all think as well that we have a little bit of a problem in our in our paralyzing community around this issue. And again, sort of catch your kind of it's really nice to see that people are resilient, but at the same time we still have got a few. So I think our sort of I think that's three individuals who said then that they were also considering leaving paragliding. But this might also not be necessarily a gender issue or things as we've kind of already highlighted. Actually, I had reports from other clubs that actually this is true of ethnic minorities as well. There have been a few individual ethnic minority pilots who have said that they were close to quitting because of this situation. And obviously, I gave them a little bit of a chance to kind of elaborate on their, um, their comments and things. And I was really saddened that a number of really serious incidences of sexual and inappropriate behaviour within the paragliding community. And I'm, I'm pleased actually the BHPA did respond to the most serious incident of that, which has now led to safeguarding policy. I think you might, I don't know if you're aware or not about that. Exactly, yeah. um, but this is actually also coming from people of authority, which is really concerning. So someone mentioned, you know, inappropriate from an instructor, from a coach, and also committee members as well. So this is really something that we need to be addressing because this is then also having a compounded impact of challenges of reporting these incidences as well. Um, we have got a lack of anonymity. If there's only one or a few women, you know, it's really hard to kind of actually report this to someone. Um, I've also reported something before and been completely ignored, not in this club, um, I'll add, um, but completely dismissed. Well, um, in the paragliding community. In the paragliding community. Um, and this is really difficult then when it's coming from people of authority. Who do you report to? You know, how do you address these things if these are coming from people that should be um, in positions of power in this sport? 
Um, but actually, sort of overwhelmingly, people were saying that the clubs are really welcoming, and actually being female is actually making people feel more included in some ways, you know, which is what I kind of mentioned. People come to me because I'm the only female in the room and say, I want to talk to you. So that's really nice. As again, you kind of pointed out, it's a lot of sort of laddish boys club kind of chat and banter, which is kind of widely reported. It has, when it's been pointed out, generally been received and understood, but you know, I think that this is something that people are kind of quite widely reporting. Um, we also discussed about how there might be more newer pilots that might feel excluded, so we're not necessarily saying that there's a gender correlation here, um, but there is this thing of you know, maybe we need to think about who's being excluded. Um, and a number of also women have said that their clubs have asked them to join the committee, which is something where it's like, great, I can see people want to tick a box, but what it actually does is actually create an additional burden onto ethnic minority or any minorities to uphold diversity work and to, you know, provide for well, clubs and things so that they can tick this box. Okay. But that's something I'll go into in a bit. So I really Cool. Um, so, I'm going to go on to a little bit more, tiny little bit more about theory. So, this book, Inclusion on Purpose, is a fantastic book. I recommend it to anyone, especially when I say normally DEI is done really badly in workplaces. So, Richika is a fantastic one, and she basically lays out how you need to do this in a workplace. Um, and I, I put this quote here from her and her book, which is I think it's really kind of exemplifies something that we really need to understand if we actually want to move forward on this topic. So she's written, um, we need to overcome exclusionary systems. So she writes, I urge them to lay down individual defences and remind them that even if they're white, male, heterosexual and financially privileged, it doesn't mean that we want them to be shamed about their privilege or that we're attacking them because of their identities. My focus is always on understanding and dismantling systems of oppression rather than blaming individuals. So to illustrate that point, she goes on to say, the problem is of men, it's patriarchy. The problem is of white people, it's white supremacy. The problem is of straight people, it's homophobia. So recognize the systems of oppression before letting our individual defenses stop you from dismantling them. So really, I think that's quite nicely to say that it doesn't matter if you come from the majority within our country is white, male, heterosexual, financial privilege. Because we've all got privilege to be in this room right now. We all have finances to be in this sport. We all have the ability to get here. We all have a house over our head, these kinds of things. And that can be really uncomfortable for us to face that. Um, but actually, I think this nicely puts it. That, isn't, that shouldn't be a barrier, that shouldn't be something to be necessarily shameful for, but it means actually we're in a fantastic position to do something about this because of our privilege and understand that actually it's not us that's a problem, but we as a collective can help work towards addressing these challenges. So, I'm asking you a big question, what do we do about it? <laughs> this is what you've come for. So what can you as individuals do about this? So number one, call out, or don't even do inappropriate behaviour or language, because this is really kind of key to inclusion in our community, and as we've already said, this is what might be driving people away, this is what makes people feel welcome, and you know, want people to be in this sport, and this is one of the things that we have got most control over, is what is our community about? How do we welcome people? If we're going to have people from different diversities, different ethnicities, different cultures, communities coming to us, what do we want to represent to those people? We want to practice inclusion on purpose. So I could do another whole talk on this. And again, read that book, Inclusion on Purpose, that really goes into it. But what that means in practice is it's not just about sitting back and well, just being friendly and welcoming, because that's great, but that's not going to get us the diversity and the equality and the inclusion that we're wanting, really. We actually need to be proactive in our activities in actually engaging different communities, different groups, and understanding their needs. And so then that leads on to the third one, which is educating yourself about DEI. Now this is a really, really difficult, complex, challenging topic. No one's going to get it right. It's really, if anyone's seen the news recently about the new Scottish law about hate crime and JK Rowling's comments, it's... What's, it's, DEI? What's DEI? 
So this is the diversity, equity, and inclusion. So sorry, that's a good point. It's bad to use acronyms, so thanks for asking. Um, you know, this is really kind of gets how, how challenging that this is a topic, but that shouldn't mean that we should be afraid of it. We need to embrace it, we need to learn, we need to understand. And so Ruchika, again from that book, Inclusion on Purpose, describes this bridge framework, which is being, being uncomfortable, and be comfortable being uncomfortable, embracing that, you know, we need to ask questions that make us face things like our privileges and what we understand about the world. Reflect on what we don't know, ask for information, learn about these things. Um, Realise that our uh, experience of something may not be the same as someone else's. Invite feedback at the appropriate time with the appropriate person and understand and learn from them why maybe you might have said something or done something or a way or a practice isn't necessarily inclusive of someone. That means understanding that this is from their perspective and this is valid as our perspectives. Defensiveness doesn't help. We can all get a little bit defensive. It can be really challenging. I had a work colleague send me an article saying about how white women need to be doing more to address challenges for coloured women and some of the language can be quite you know, direct, and it made me feel uncomfortable. And I had to go walk away and I was like, okay, am I feeling this way because it's actually accusing me as a white person for needing to do more about racism in the workplace? You know, we need to overcome these, these, families, these challenges of feeling defensive. <coughs> we need to grow from our mistakes. We will make mistakes, it's gonna be difficult, but understanding that making progress does mean actually making mistakes along the way and expect that change is going to take time. These are huge cultural shifts we need to understand, not only the environment we're working in, but also about the language and the tools that we're going to do to be able to engage in this and actually make um, this sport actually inclusive. And I wish it's going to happen overnight, but it's, it's going to take time. So we really want to sort of develop this growth mindset. We want to come and ally so we people can start in the fear zone, which is denying that there's a problem at all, we're avoiding these difficult questions, uh, we're sitting in our own comfort zone essentially in this fear, we're just denying that anything, and it's not really a problem, you know, whatever, everyone's the same, you know, you just need some money, go on, fly. But the fact we're all here obviously demonstrates that we're very least in the learning zone, so we're actually wanting to understand and um, realise, you know, what are these difficult questions that we need to do, we need to see where this discrimination is a problem, we're educating ourselves, and we're making ourselves vulnerable about our own biases and our knowledge challenges that we need to be addressing. And we're listening and speaking to people from different groups and different ethnicities with different experiences. But to actually make any of this change, we need to go into this growth zone. So we need to look at, we're examining really who benefits from systems of oppression which would promote discrimination. We want to promote and advocate for leaders who really uh, buy into this diversity, we sit with our own discomfort, we speak out when we hear things that are inappropriate, we educate others, we're seeing and we're learning from our mistakes, we, this is an interesting one, yield positions of power to otherwise marginalised groups. That doesn't necessarily mean burdening people with responsibility, but what that means is, is using our positions of privilege, being white, having these things, in order to provide those opportunities to others who don't necessarily have the same as us. And we're also surrounding ourselves with diversity. We're learning from different people, different groups. What can clubs do about it now? So, I think on the one hand we've got members, we're going from a bottom up, but this also needs to have from a top down. And awareness and representation and intersectionality really does matter. And particularly within leadership, and decision making. So that's coming from committee members, that's from coaches, that's from instructors, anyone in positions, we really need leadership on this topic. And this is uh, a meme that gets thrown around the women's group every so often, I would say, um, which basically is a group of men with one woman and someone saying, well, you're, you're the only one who thinks we're a sexist organisation. So we kind of need to move away from this and recognise and understand that this individual has actually valid experiences that then can help us to move forward. 
So I thought I'd give you a few little concrete things, because I know you want those, Martin. <laughs> so we need obviously inclusive leadership and buy-in, and this means, again, educating ourselves, becoming um, that we're, we're really kind of believing and making the support of what the club really stands for. Um, what we've also highlighted is that we have got a little bit of a culture that's slightly inappropriate, so we need to make sure that we've got a zero tolerance of that, developing safeguarding and reporting processes to kind of make sure that, you know, we're actually hearing and seeing these things and trying to, again, promote this inclusivity within our clubs. Is the club running equitably and inclusively? I mean, maybe, maybe not, from what we've done a little bit of a discussion about earlier. We need to kind of be listening to those people who said they thought about putting. We need to think about those people who said we don't, they don't have someone in this club that they can relate to and understand why that is and we really need to be addressing that. Outreach and engagement work is obviously really important because we can't just sit back here. If we actually want to go and have more people from different groups, different ethnicities, different um, genders and things, we need to be actually out there and going through that equity, we need to be providing those additional resources, addressing some of those challenges. Is paragliding safe? Who's going to best help them out with that but us? They're not going to find out themselves. We need to be actually actively engaging with these things. We need to create safe spaces within our community to discuss these issues and, as I mentioned, about facilitating those tools and the language that we need to be able to have those conversations and we can't have those conversations unless people feel safe. So I've also become aware recently South Downs Club have appointed a diversity officer, which I've got mixed feelings about. On the one hand, it basically is great that they want to put diversity within their club, which is fantastic. But I would also say that this then lends to it being sort of one person's responsibility to deal with all diversity issues, when actually this needs to be something from everyone. And this is members, this is committee members. This is the culture and this is all everyone needs to be involved in that. So I wouldn't necessarily having a diversity officer in particular is the way forward. But you know, I think it's a great start. Sorry, we can we just go back one yeah. there? Safeguarding mm -hmm. uh, in, in environments where safeguarding mm -hmm. happens or has to happen, it's very serious legal connotation. Yeah. So in what context do you Applying here, so you know, there's minors. Is there a legal requirement on BHPA to have a safeguarding system? If there's training, if there's minors involved, then clearly there has to be. So uh, it's not just minors. Goes to well, I, I, well, minors and yeah, but it has specific context, doesn't it? So either in minors or people with specific disabilities, there are specific legal safeguarding requirements. What, what that does safeguarding actually mean? So, good question. So, safeguarding is really for, um, it's about safeguarding people against any form of abuse that could, obviously you've got the obvious of physical, mental abuse, but you can have financial, you can have sexual abuse, you can have any kind of abuse. It's the recognition of abuse and a reporting system in which that is dealt with. So normally, so I, I previously used to work in mental health, so I used to do a lot of safeguarding um, that would go to adult social care and that would be how then you would get social services involved. Um, so it's not necessarily about minors, it's well, literally that was, that was an example. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, but specifically, there was mm -hmm. a legal requirement in that environment to have safeguarding processes in place. Now, yeah. you can talk about safeguarding in the round, mm -hmm. as in terms of everybody should be safe in this club, mm -hmm. and everybody should you know, be called out in appropriate behaviour, and that's mm -hmm. great. But I get slightly concerned when you start talking about safeguarding in a legal context in an environment like this, which is a club, which probably doesn't have any legal safeguarding. I don't know. Um, I, don't, um, I, I don't know. Yeah. The um, whole of the Yorkshire area uh, has a, a sports umbrella organisation that actually reaches out to uh, gets a lot of feedback and provides training to all sorts of coaching clubs. Now, we're a co coaching club as well. We're just very different from, from the way <coughs> that uh, most others operate. Uh, you know, they're talking mainly about things like badminton, cricket, uh, other sports, uh, where actually safeguarding does play a large part uh, in that. 
Uh, when I feed back to these folks, it's kind of a very alien organisation that we don't have a building, uh, that uh, our coaches are, um, you know, from all uh, areas of the sport in terms of experience and qualifications, uh, and that, uh, you know, we don't have any, uh, as a club, uh, financial benefit from new members coming in so there's no bleed over between instructing and, and coaching but safe, safeguarding is, a, is a, a whole heap of what they do talk about and train each other about yeah but and, also I mean probably more relevant is the fact that BHPA has got a safeguarding policy which applies to all of us mm. to all clubs and schools but we're, it, we're lucky as a club we mainly fly as individuals safeguarding is more of an issue for instructors Tandem pilots, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for that sort of thing. But he, he, so in, in, the, in the senior coaching course, I mean, that was 15 minutes, I think. Yeah, I don't think it's on the coaching course. Well, I mean, it's like, it's like climbing. If you climb, there's two peers, you have a responsibility to each other. There's no requirement to have any qualification to be able to climb together. If you teach somebody climbing, you've got to have very specific qualifications, you've got to have insurance. So there's a difference between a club where you fly as peers and you work together where there's no commercial or financial gain to be made then you know, it, it's an interest it's an interesting particularly when you start talking about things that can have legal connotation mm. so this isn't necessarily about legalities but it's about safety and the particular incident that led to the bhpa um, now having a safeguarding policy um, isn't necessarily as a result of someone teaching someone it's about providing protection for people which may be less um, needed in sort of if we're not necessarily directly working with particularly vulnerable people but is relevant to everyone to have that safe um, mechanism in place to be able to report and get involved as necessary if things do become a serious incident um, and I'm sad to say that that has happened in the paragliding community and therefore is something that clubs should be aware of and have, should have some kind of action that when, if and when those kind of things happen that the appropriate response is made um, and this isn't necessarily about legalities this, we're not necessarily talking about crimes being committed but we are talking about incidences of abuse which have happened um, and it's something that clubs and committee members and anyone of any kind of position of responsibility and authority should have an understanding in um, and be able to respond appropriately to. Yeah. So um, that's that's what we mean by it's just the a specific terms. Yeah. Yeah. So safeguard. No, sorry. Apologies. I should have I should have explained that. It's, uh, it's about dealing with um, with forms of abuse. Um, yeah, yeah. What, what's the difference between zero tolerance for inappropriate behaviour and addressing inappropriate behaviour? Zero tolerance sounds like there's a strong, that you might be chucked out of a club for a, um, in an unintentional comment. It was something that I was debating on the, the, the wording of, so it's quite interesting you picked up on it. And uh, it's one that I'm not necessarily going to dictate how a club responds to that. However, what I'm trying to imply is that a club should respond to any kind of incident of it. But that yeah. response could turn that on its head. Yeah. And don't say that should, again. You know, uh, it can be about saying, hey, sorry, that's not quite appropriate. Yeah. You know, let's but that's a conversation yeah. to have. And this is where I'm saying, you know, actually this is where we're building that that kind of culture of like being, you know, it might be a flyaway comment to one person, but actually this isn't something that we should be kind of accepting um, because what is a laugh to one person isn't necessarily to someone else. And again, this isn't just about taking this you know, too seriously. It's about that feeling of people being welcome and included and actually wanting to participate in the sport and just being sensitive and aware of those things, really. Um, so that's the point that I was trying to make. Okay. Um, so that's kind of internally, but, uh, and I promise these are the last couple of slides. So what I was trying to do, so I launched a project called Vibe Gals last year, which I did with a couple of people sort of 
in the background giving some support. So this was generically towards women, which people said, oh yeah, but what about everyone else? And as I mentioned at the beginning, I can't represent every single person. If people from LGBTQ community or neurodivergence or different social classes as well, because we mentioned people from, say, white working class can also have challenges, great, get on board, let's try and do something. But at the moment, obviously, this is what my area was in and my experience is, so this is what I'm doing. Um, so obviously working within the community isn't something that I originally looked at, but now this year I think is actually kind of important. So this is about working on inclusivity. So educating, hopefully bringing you a little bit of an idea and starting to introduce concepts about DEI and creating that kind of conversation, starting with conversations about things. I'm not going to claim credit for it because the Women's Telegram group already existed before I did, but it's about promoting the other groups, the so Women's Telegram group, I set up a Northern Women's Telegram group, um, as well, so uh, WhatsApp group, just to try and connect people, again, women in, in the North, um, so hopefully we can fly together. Connecting internationally, so there's a, um, a young woman, Marie, kind of similar to me, she set up Fly Like a Girl in the States, and she's been generating income to try and help um, provide money for sponsorship for female flyers to be able to go and further their education, and that can be in any discipline, not necessarily paragliding. Um, so trying to build connections with them. Um, young paralleling groups as well, because younger people also might want to go travelling together and maybe, you know, doing things with young people makes a difference. But again, so similarly, we just want to build connections because clubs are important, but also having that sense of belonging to whoever you feel like you identify with most is really important for retention. And obviously doing research, I think that kind of underpins everything that we're going to have to do when we're working space. As a matter of interest, do you know how many women there are in the Telegram group? Um, have a look. I think there are 115 at the moment. Right, I think. That's in comparison to, I think, I sent you 422 female mm. So yes, yeah, so it doesn't necessarily so can't capture third, one female. So yes, yeah, so it's literally we're trying to spread it by word of mouth really. So if there are other people, then that would be great. Yeah, it's not a formal thing, so but yeah, it'd be good to reach out. And then the other side of things is obviously the external engagement, which is about addressing these diversity and equity issues and trying to bring people into this sport. So some of the broader topics about engaging outdoor communities. So I now am connected with um, All the Elements, which is a community for different diversity groups work within the outdoors doing a variety of different things across the UK um, and I'm trying to reach out to them because I think the outdoors the community is probably the people who are most likely to want to engage with something like paragliding rather than people off the street necessarily um, and they're kind of reaching out to a broad range of different ethnicities, different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, they are really reaching the marginalised communities. So I'm working with them at the moment. Um, I had some contact with She in Action, which is a platform to try and get women into different sports as well. So that's something I want to develop. And then thinking about those other things, you know, about increasing accessibility of information. You know, is it safe? How do I get into this sport? These kinds of things. Because paralyzing is quite a hidden sport, really. Unless you're already engaged with the outdoors on the right day, at the right place, you're not going to see it. Um, and I think a lot of information from the BHPA website, unless you know how to get there. I have people say, how do I get into this? People don't know how to get there, and you know it's really challenging. It's Promoting role models because, again, going back to that, that British Mountaineering Council, over those women say we don't see people like us. Okay, if people don't see that, they don't see that they don't feel like they belong there. So thank you very much, Wesley. Has if you've not already heard, has invited Kinga. It's going to be coming over to the UK. We're going to be doing some work with her, so she's really keen to get involved and do some work on diversity, so we're going to hopefully have some projects running uh, in June and hopefully some opportunities for you to meet her potentially. Um, so King is a great obviously role model as the first female to qualify for the X Alps and the only female to repeatedly qualify for the X Alps. Uh, so we can do some work with her and obviously again always research, research, research on what more we can be doing to address these problems. So final, final thing, some lessons, some things I want you to take away. Get comfortable being uncomfortable, okay? This is going to be challenging. We're going to have to learn about tools and language, addressing the sort of um, privileges we have and the challenges, um, and having conversations with people that might be difficult.
Creating safety, psychological safe spaces within our clubs is crucial for our ability to progress with this journey. This is going to take time, it's going to take care, empathy, and a lot of trust in each other. Okay. And finally, we need you because at the end of the day, all this is just going to be words unless you actually really want to engage with this and take this on and want to learn and move this forward. So thank you. Thank you.